because it reminds us, I think, of things that we forget. And so I thought it would be good for us to watch this morning before we got started, just as a reminder of why we're here, right? Um, we're not here for me to tell you how much stuff I think I know. We're not here for you to try to remember things necessarily. We're not here to kind of do like an intellectual exercise right now where we learn about the Bible and we leave knowing more about the Bible. We're here so that our lives can be transformed and that through the preaching of the word, the Holy Spirit can move in each of us to change our lives, right? That we would leave from here and things would be different in some way. And it might not necessarily be an amazingly transformational way. It might be a simple way. For some of us, it literally could be different forever. For others of us, it might just be a small step or a different direction that we take. But that's the goal. That's my goal this morning. And so I thought that a video like that would be good for us to watch. Funny. He's, Francis Chan is a wonderful guy. Um, let me pray for us. Lord, we all come in here, uh, most of us wet. Um, uh, we also come in with a lot of burdens. We come in tired. Um, some of us come in discouraged. Others come in happy and excited, ready to hear uh, what you've got to say. Lord, wherever we all are, I pray that you would prepare us for what we're going to read in your word this morning. I pray that you would speak to each of our hearts that just by the reading of your word, Lord, um, you are at work. And so take this time that we spend with you, which, which in comparison to the rest of our lives is really a small piece of time. Take it and use it for your good and for your glory. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, those of you that were here last week, you'll remember that what we started to talk about was a, a portion of time in Abram and Sarai's life where they hit this space where things were not as they expected, right? Uh, God gave them uh, promises, really specifically four promises. Um, and, you know, the fact that... that uh, Abraham's name would be uh, great, started to kind of be fulfilled, didn't it? The, the, start, the, the, the promise that he, his promises, his, uh, he would be blessed, you know, people that bless him will be blessed, and people that curse him will be cursed. That started to be fulfilled in, in a way. A lot of the promises started to be fulfilled, but there was one promise that was left that they were kind of left wanting, right? He was going to be a great nation. He was going to be a great nation. And at that point, years later, he still didn't have kids, he didn't have a son, and they didn't really know how that promise was going to be fulfilled. And so Hagar, uh, uh, and so Sarai comes up with a plan, right? She says, well, I've seen folks around me do this, so how about we take Hagar, our maidservant? My husband has sex with her, they have a child, and then maybe that can be the way through which God fulfills that promise. They come up with that plan, they carry out that plan, and what we read last week showed us that things didn't necessarily seem to be going as well as they could have been going, right? I mean, Abram had a son. His name was Ishmael. And so it seemed as if things could be going in a good direction. But then there was all this other stuff, right? Sarai and Hagar hated each other. And, and, and uh, later on, when we see them leave because of Sarai's horrible treatment, we see the angel of the Lord show up to minister to Hagar, and yet the words that the angel spoke, half were kind of positive and half seemed kind of like wishy-washy or confusing at, at, at a minimum, right? So I asked everybody um, as an encouragement to move ahead and try to read in Genesis chapter 21. And so for a show of hand, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, before we get to Genesis chapter 21, what I want to do is talk about a key moment that happened in Genesis chapter 17 for those of you that either skipped the 21 or didn't get a chance to read it all or didn't, you know, didn't read the in-between there. In Genesis chapter 17, God comes back again and he, he reiterates some of the promises he's already said and he makes something more clear. Do you remember last week when we were talking about the fact that the promise was that Abram would, would be a great nation, but there was not a lot of detail. I mean, there's a detail about quantity numerous as the stars, like the dust on the earth, but not details about how or when or whatever. In Genesis chapter 17, God comes and makes it very clear 
No, you're going to be a great nation. And the way that you're going to be a great nation is your wife is going to have a son and his name is going to be Isaac. So now there's no general stuff going on. It's very clear how this is going to happen. So this lady who's pushing 100 and Abram, who is 100, are going to have a kid. Um, I'm 39. I don't, I feel like I'm 100. <laughs> Could you imagine that? Anyway, um, so, so it's very clear. That's what God's going to do, and he's going to do it specifically through Sarah. So Abram's natural question and our natural question ought to be, well, what the heck's going to happen to Ishmael then? I mean, this whole thing happened, and now God comes and says, nah, it's not him. It, it's it's going to be Isaac. What happens to Ishmael? That's where we pick up this morning. Um, Genesis chapter one, 21 uh, starts to answer some of our questions, but doesn't completely answer them, and we're going to have to completely answer them by going to the New Testament later, and so that's what we'll do in a bit. I want to introduce you to a concept, though, before we get started in, 20, in Genesis 21. In Genesis chapter 17, God talks about the fact that his promise is going to go through Isaac, and the words mentioned all throughout here, um, and Vince pr preached on this in the past as well, about the word covenant. And so if you're not familiar with the word covenant, it's, it's a pretty important Bible word to be familiar with. When you think about covenant, just realize that it's not... It's not really complicated, and it was taken from a specific context. You know, these guys lived in an ancient Near Eastern world where there were like real houses and real people and you know, real place names, the places that we know, real rivers that are still there. You know, these were real folks. These aren't made up stories. These are real things. So in the ancient Near Eastern context in which Abram lived, people made covenants all the time. It was a very common thing. If I am a poor, lonely farmer in the middle of kind of nowhere, uh, I'm at risk, right? I'm at risk. At any moment in time, small groups of, of soldiers, large armies, robbers, all kinds of people can come to my farm, uh, rape and kill my, my daughters, take my sons and use them for their own military purposes, and leave me with nothing at, at any time. You were very exposed. And so what they did was they would find local kings or rulers or powerful people and they would make agreements with them. So they would say, look, I feel very exposed. When these folks come to bang down our door, I want to be able to say, King Colin is my guy. And if you mess with me, you mess with him. To which they would say, all right, we're, not, we're good. We'll go next door, mess with them. And so what people like me would do, the farmer, I would go to King Colin and say, please, look, uh, I'll give you a portion of my crops. I'll give you a portion of the, the money that I make. Um, I'll serve you if you ever have a war you need to fight. I will be happy to be one of your soldiers. In whatever way I need to serve you, I will serve you. But I, I want to be known as yours. I want to be protected by you so that when people see me, they see you. They don't see me. So that if they think about messing with me, they think about messing with you and say, no, nah, I don't want any part of that. And so they, they would make that agreement. They would make that covenant. All right? That's all it is. That really all, is all it is. And so God takes that concept that they would have completely understood and begins to, to, to show them what he's going to do in creating a relationship with them, creating this family of his. You know, think about it. God knew the folks before Abram showed up, but there was not necessarily formal relationship yet, right? Formal agreement between them that this is how things will be. You could say that there was a little bit with Adam and a little bit with Noah, but nothing like this. And so when we read in Genesis, God's creating a relationship with Abram that's really brand new. It's special. He's making it clear what it means to be a part of his family and what it means to not be a part of his family, right? What it means to be in and what it means to be out, essentially. That's what God is doing. He's creating this family of his, and he does that through the concept of a covenant. And so when we move ahead, we learn that there are some people that are in that covenant and some people that are not in that covenant. And so when God says, my promise will go through Isaac, it means that Ishmael is not a part of that group. It's not a part of that group. And so, like I said, that's why everybody says, well, then what in the world happens to this guy? What, what in the world happens to this guy? 
And we'll see that that's Abraham's first question. Turn with me to Genesis 21. We're going to start verse 8. Um, so what happens just prior to this in the chapter is Isaac is born. Um, so there you go. We just skipped seven verses. Um, <laughs> saving you time. You see what I'm doing? Saving you time. So verse 8. Let's read what happens with Hagar and Ishmael. So it says, And the child grew and was weaned. Child is Isaac. And Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, that's Ishmael, right? Whom she had born to Abraham, laughing. So she said to Abraham, cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son Isaac. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, do not be displeased because of what the boy, because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Notice that. Let's just pause for a second. I want you to notice that all throughout this narrative, it's the boy. It's your maidservant. It's your maidservant's son. Very interesting. Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And I will make a nation of the son of the slave woman also, because he is your offspring. So Abram rose early in the morning <clears throat> and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness in Beersheba. When the water and the skin was gone, she put the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up! Lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt." And so, it's a pretty clear story, no? I mean, again, I said last week, it's one of the best parts of the Old Testament. Is the hard part isn't understanding the story. Um, but here's the gist. Isaac is in, Ishmael's out, right? Isaac is in, Ishmael's out. So the question is, what's going to come of Ishmael? Why is this happening to him? All those kind of things. We're going to talk about that a little bit. So, really quickly, let's cruise through it. Isaac is born, and yet another fit of rage. Sarah clearly needs anger management, right? Um, uh, she is very upset by, what, by something that Ishmael does. Now, this says laughed. I don't know what the, the New Living says or any of your other translations. They're translated a whole bunch of different ways. The quite, that nobody really necessarily knows what Ishmael does. Um, but he does something that makes Sarah pretty unhappy. Sarah goes to Abraham yet again, one of these kind of moments, and says, get her out of here. And it, you can't pick up on it, but when it says that he was very displeased or greatly displeased, that's a really strong emotion. He didn't just kind of, it wasn't no big deal for him. It's not like, oh, well, okay, Isaac's in, good, let's get rid of Ishmael. Abraham was distraught over this amazingly distraught. And God says to him, listen to your wife. Do what she's saying. Send them away because it'll be through Isaac and not through the slave boy. Not through the slave woman's son. Send them away. I, I honestly can only imagine uh, what, what Abram was dealing with at this point, right? The other confusing part of the story. Uh, 
different translations do different things. Some say lad, because we're English, I guess. Some say child. Um, he would have been 15 or 16. So older than you would think, right? And there's some parts of this that are confusing because it says she throws the water over her shoulder and then it says along with the boy. And what we do is we group those things together and assume she's got water on one shoulder and the boy on the other shoulder walking through the desert. That's not what's happening. She's got water on her shoulder and she's along with the boy. When it says she put him under the tree, she just left him there. She didn't pick him up and set him down. He was an older boy. It takes give or take three years, two to three years typically for weaning for a child. So Isaac would have been probably three years old at this point. So again, the ages are a little bit older than we probably were used to hearing the story if we've ever heard it before. So the reason why I tell you that is because Ishmael is fully aware of what is happening. The kid knows what's going on. He's being abandoned. He's being abandoned by his dad, left to be off with his mom alone. This is a kid who's grown enough to realize what in the world is going on? And then they end up meeting the angel of the Lord again, right? And what's cool to me, this is where it starts to get exciting to me, and this is where this story uh, is one of my favorites. There's just some key things that happen in this story that are absolutely amazing, okay? Number one, did you notice the miracle that happens? There's a miracle in here. She can't see. What's right in front of her face? And God opens her eyes so that she can see it. Which in and of itself is another sermon, right? You're blind even though you're not blind. You can't see something even though you can see. And God has to open your eyes for you to see the provision that he's already given you right in front of your face. But because you're so overwhelmed with your own struggles and, and, and your sadness or your guilt or your anger or whatever, you're blind even though you're not blind. I mean, that, I'll, that's another sermon for another day. But that's a miraculous thing. She can't see, and yet the God opens her eyes. God hears the cries of Ishmael. He hears it. I don't know if he was praying. I don't know if he was just, God, I can't, what's happening? I don't know what he was saying. But God listens to him. But yet he's not the son of promise. It's confusing. Third, and the most important part, and this is what you guys are going to think I'm weird, but that's all right, because I'm kind of weird. In verse 20, it says that God is with Ishmael. Now, let me tell you something. Um, some of the most important words in the entire Bible are words like but and because and in order that and or. They're huge words. They don't seem like it but they're huge words. Some of the worst sermons ever preached from, not here, but from places like this um, are, are from folks that don't know the significance of those words and they put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable when they preach. And they say that this thing is the most important part of that section of scripture when they just missed a little word like because. Huge. So it says that God was with Ishmael. Now, with isn't typically as big as, you know, the becauses and all that. But the reason why this one is big is because God isn't just with any old people. God isn't just with any old people. He's with people like Abraham. He's with people like Jacob. He's with people like Enoch. He's not with just any old person. So when it says God's with Ishmael, essentially all the rest of his days as he grows up, Guys, we have to re realize that God is with him, caring for him, watching him make mistakes, bringing things into his life in order to... He's with him. He is with, present with Ishmael. Which is, again, what? Isaac's the son of promise. So what in the world is going on here? At best, it's confusing. A little bit, at least. Let me read you a quote. It says, the promised blessings of Ishmael spoken to Abraham, the intense love Abraham had for Ishmael, and the seemingly salvific action of God in this current passage lead even the most astute scholar to question God's actions. No? Strange. Um, 
later on, when the same similar thing happens to Esau, nobody sheds a tear for that guy. He's a bit of a knucklehead, gives up his birthright. We get the feeling that he's kind of a jerk. And so when he's not the chosen one, no one says, oh, Esau, but, but come on. It's a little bit easier to understand. Still a lot of weird stuff in that story too, but a little bit easier to understand. What did Ishmael do? Chuckle? He looked and chuckled. Maybe he chuckled in the wrong direction and then became uh, the, 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 you know, the, the whipping boy for Sarah. What in the world did, did Ishmael do to deserve this? What did Ishmael do to deserve what he's getting? That question is the key to this whole thing. It is the key. But it's not really that question, right? There's always a question behind the question. And so what's the question behind that question? What did Ishmael do to deserve this? The question behind that question is, how could God treat someone like this? How could God treat someone like this? And that's where it starts to get really good. Trust me, we're not there yet. We're not to the good part yet. But either way you slice it, it is clear, it is crystal clear. Isaac is in, Ishmael is out. And the truth of the matter, matter, guys, is that's true. Some folks are in and some folks are not. And that's what this says. I didn't say it. That's what this says. It's not a popular thing to say now, is it? You go out and you see there are preachers all over the country right now, potentially right now, preaching passages that are similar to this, thinking to themselves, if I say this, I'm going to alienate half of my audience. So I got to soften it a little. I got to find a way to say it a little differently so that I don't offend anybody. Here's the thing. I didn't say it. I'm just reading the Bible. I didn't say it. So I can't soften God. I can't soften God. But what I can do is understand him. Just, that's what happens, right, with us. We, we read stuff and we say, what? And we think that because we say, what? That it must be legitimate for us to say that, right? How in the world could this be? So because we think we know so much and have all this stuff figured out, we can't stop ourselves and say, well, hold on for a second. God's good and he's merciful and he's gracious. So there's something going on here that maybe I don't get. Let me, let me dig more. Let me, instead of reading it and then translating it a different way. Well, it doesn't really mean that. Doesn't really, you know, it really mean when he, when he says cast them into the wilderness and you know they're giving them water and bread and stuff because they're scared they're going to die. It really means like they were going to a, an amusement park for like rides and they needed a packed lunch so that at lunchtime that you know what I'm saying. Like, we, but we can't do that. We can't do that. And this is the sweet spot of where I think God just shines. These are verses that I think are amazing. It is not popular for us to say that some people are in and some people are out. But what I can tell you this morning is that that fact makes the whole ball game possible. Turn with me to Romans chapter 9. Book of Romans, if you're not familiar with it, it comes after the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the book of Acts is after the book of John, and after Acts is the book of Romans. Um, Paul picks up on some of this stuff that we talked about today, and so that's why we're going to read it. But, but I want to get back to the question that we asked a second ago before we jump into Romans chapter 9. What did Ishmael do to deserve this? Right? What did Hagar do to deserve this? Uh, uh, one improper glance? You know, one, I, I don't understand. That's, that's a good question. But here's what that question misses. Nobody in these stories deserves anything, okay? Hagar is a witch, and I picked that word because I'm in church. She's not a nice person at all. She comes off looking like a really terrible person in these stories, okay? Abraham, it's like he doesn't exist. And, and at least we get a little emotion out of the guy this time, so we know he's got a pulse, but other than that, well, do with her what you want. You get it. Well, 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 well. He, there's all this stuff going on, man. Do something. And he does nothing. Hagar, the 
instant she conceives, looks at Sarai with a look, doesn't she? We might not know what it is, but we know what she did. And Ishmael, when he sees the son of promise being exalted, responds in a way to try to inject himself into that. Jealousy? We don't know. There is no one in this story that deserves anything from God. No one that deserves any kindness from Him at all. That's what we forget, I think, sometimes. We assume that folks start off good. The Bible sees it the other way. Open with me to Romans chapter 9. So, the book of Romans is amazing. Um, Paul has been making an argument in the book of Romans up until this point in chapter 8 and chapter 9. He's trying to woo the Jews back to God to believe um, again. Woo either uh, Jews that have been lost or Jews that never were uh, true believers. And Romans chapter 8 and Romans chapter 9, kind of, that's a crescendo of the book. And this section of Romans chapter 9, some would say, is literally the whole crescendo of the whole book. And some would say that this is like the ballgame of the whole Bible. This is God's whole story wrapped up into a few verses explained like that for us, okay? And the beauty of it is he picks up on all this stuff we've been reading in the book of Genesis. We're going to start in verse 6. I can't, unfortunately, go through the whole thing, so we're going to have to start with a but, um, which drives me crazy, but sorry, we don't have time. So uh, we're going to go through this slowly because Paul says a lot of words and sometimes he's hard to follow. And so I want to make sure that we're all kind of with his argument as he goes. So verse 6, he says, But it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. So you catch what he's seeing? He's saying he's starting to cause a distinction between physical birth and this other thing, this other kind of promisey, special, true child thing. There's a difference between those two. Um, not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Okay, so we're getting that. We've already talked a little bit about that, right? Isaac is the child of promise. We get that. Verse 9. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. This is the part we skipped in Genesis. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had, not, had, had done nothing either good or bad. Pause. You hear that? Let me read that again. Verse 10. Not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. Did you catch that? Nothing good or bad that they did, and yet before they were even born, God chose the one who was the child of promise. So it has nothing to do with good or bad. How could they do this to Ishmael? Nothing to do with that. This is God's sovereign call. It's God's sovereign choice. Let's go back. Uh, no, you stay where you are. I'm going to go back to Genesis. Okay? And the reason why is because I'm a bit annoying. Um, one of the most often misunderstood passages of the Bible, Noah. Noah was a well, he was a drunk. He was a drunk. But before he was a drunk, he was a... There's a song. Nobody knows the song. Noah was a righteous man. No? Noah was a righteous man. Genesis chapter 6, <clears throat> verse 9. It says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And Noah had three sons. So people say, God chose Noah because Noah was a righteous man. And what they forget to do is read the verse right before that one that says, But Noah found favor in the eyes 
of the Lord. God chose Noah, not because he was righteous, but because he found favor in God's eyes. God chooses, not because we're good or bad, but because he, cho he chooses us. Sorry, back to Romans. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Because I'm sure none of us are thinking that. No one here is thinking that. No one is thinking, how can God do this kind of stuff? This does not seem fair at all. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then, he has mercy on whomever, whom, whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. That's tough, no? That's tough. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair. But again, remember, when you hit the points where you think there's no answer, well, what in the world's going on here? Keep reading. Keep reading with me. Verse 19. This is where it gets simply amazing. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? Will what's molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make, to make out of the same lump one vessel for honored use and another for dishonorable use? Let's pause there for a second. So, so think about this. The potter makes what he wants with the clay. The clay doesn't say, make me, make me a good little you know, cup mug to drink coffee out of. Make me a good thing that you're going to do good things with. The clay is the clay, and the potter does what he wills with the clay. That's God with us. That's God with us. God created us, you and me. He is the reason why we exist in the first place. It's his desire to do with his people what he wants to do. We have to always remember that. We have to quiet that part of us that screams out and says, but I'm special, but I have a say. We need to quiet that and say, God is God. <laughs> God is God. He is other. He is holy. He is sovereign on his throne. He may be a whole lot of other things as well. He may be with us. He may be Jesus. He may be holy. He may be, but he is other God. He is holy and righteous like no one, like no one in this room, including myself and everybody on the earth. He is God. And here's where we get to the best part. Verse 22. What if God, and this is just awesome, we're going to like crawl like turtles through this. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to, pause, in order to, important thing coming up, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us, us the Jews he's talking about. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Let's pause. We can't go through the whole book of Romans, but here's the deal. That's a huge statement. That is a massive statement. God, from the time of Abraham, has been creating a family. Isaac is in, Ishmael is out. Right? Jacob is in, Esau is out. He's been creating this family, showing the world who he is by creating a boundary. How do you necessarily know what good is if there's no bad? And so God creates this boundary and says, this is what it means to be a part of my family. You're welcome to join. And he does that by creating a family. And he's been doing that since the time of Abraham. And Jesus shows up and does these little things, right? With people, like women at wells and stuff. And, and you're like, but I don't, this is a little strange. Isn't he supposed to not talk to those people? And we get glimpses in the rest of the Bible, just here and there, folks that aren't Jews, but they're really special. They do special things. 
And then Paul comes and blows everything up. And he says, what if God has been enduring these folks year after year and all of the knucklehead stuff that you've seen, he's seen too. It's not like he didn't see all of this stuff that they do. It's not like he wasn't the God begging them to return to him over and over when they kept saying, we're good. We're good. We're good. What if God endured all of that just so he could show his mercy, not just to them, but to everybody? What if that was the whole purpose of this thing from the beginning? Unbelievable. Verse 25. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. <sighs> that is unbelievable to me. God endured all of this for so many years so that he could look at the people who are not his people and say, come, you're mine. Come. Do you see what's happened through the life of my people and how they've run from me and how they've wanted nothing to do with me? Guess what? I've been dealing with that so that you could see me. So that the whole world could see me. And so the whole purpose of why Jesus came is made clear now, right? Jesus didn't just come to save folks in a certain group that God had gone to and called many, many years ago. Jesus came to break all that out of the water and save the entire world. So that he could open his arms up to everyone and say, come. You know who that includes? That includes the Pharaoh that Paul himself mentions that God hardened. We don't know what happened to Pharaoh necessarily later on. I mean, maybe he was swallowed up in the water with all the rest of them, right? But we don't know. What, what, what about, what about, um, what about Hagar and Ishmael? God was with Ishmael for the rest of his life. He wasn't a son of promise. Does that not mean that Jesus couldn't save him too? What, what, have you ever wondered how it is that people like Moses and Noah got to heaven before Jesus? Like, how'd that work? Maybe it was different back then. Nope. The blood of Jesus covers everybody. The blood of Jesus goes back to the beginning of time and covers everybody. It's no different. And so the blood of Jesus can cover even people like Hagar and Ishmael. So why is God so merciful to them? Because it's bigger than this, guys. What we're reading, God knows he sees the beginning uh, and the end. This whole thing is bigger than what he's creating. And so, yes, he's creating a family to show, to be light to the nations, a light in the midst of darkness. He's doing that to show the world who he is, but he sees the end from the beginning. And so he knows that Hagar and Ishmael, if their hearts are for him, and they walk toward him, and they open the door that's being, that, you know, the, the, if they pursue him, if they open their hearts to him, if they move toward him, his arms are like this. His arms are like this. The reason why this is exciting to me is because um, you, you won't hear people say this. <laughs> this, is no, this is weird with me. Um, most people would say there is no way that Hagar and Ishmael could be saved ever. Not possible. Ishmael's not the child of promise. Not a part of the covenant. He's gone. And, and, and that is the, the typical kind of theology of the world. And I say, how do you meet Paul then? The guy makes it explicitly clear that being in and out and flesh or not it is irrelevant. What matters is whether you're a part of the promise. So how do you read this? Well, why do you think he draws on all of this stuff to make it clear that he was doing all these things? No, but it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. I'm not going to put limitations on the power of Jesus' death on the cross. I'm just not going to do it. It's absolutely amazing. So here's what I want to say to you guys today. Christians, those of you that call yourselves followers of Christ, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor today. You're going to hear in the next two to three minutes something that makes you think that it's an altar call. It's not. But what happens is when we hear that, we shut our brains off. I'm saved already. I'm good. I don't need to hear what he's saying. He's talking to the non-Christians that are next to me or in a row behind me. 
And honestly, I think if we read the Bible, we kind of misunderstand the whole salvation thing. Uh, we think of it as a moment, and I think God thinks it of it as a lifetime. So I'm going to ask you to suspend that tendency right now. In a room this size, I know that there are people who have not given their entire heart to Jesus. I know it. It doesn't matter when you got saved. It doesn't matter if you're a visitor and you can't wait to leave. Right? It doesn't matter. I know that in a room this size, there are some of you sitting here saying, you know, <laughs> I, gave him, I gave him my Sundays, I'm giving him pieces, but I just, there are parts that I'm, I'm not willing to do that yet. There are things I'm holding on to that maybe even nobody knows about that I don't know how to let go of those things. I just don't know how. In a room this size, I know that there are people that wonder whether they really belong to him. You belong to your job. You belong to your family. You belong to your spouse. You belong to your children. You belong to your wallet. You belong to your cell phone. But you're not positive you belong to Jesus and that you are his. I know that in a room this size, there are folks that wonder whether God delights in you. He looks at you and he simply delights in you. And you're running and running, trying to do things and act in certain ways that will bring that delight to you. Doing things and acting in certain ways and hopefully you can feel as if he really cares for you. All the while not realizing that it has nothing to do with what you do. Nothing to do with what you say. Nothing to do with what you've said or the people you've hurt. And it has everything to do with God and his choice and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so what I'm going to encourage you to do this morning is to remember some things that you might have forgotten or think of them for the first time if this is the first time you're hearing them. No one is beyond his reach. Do you hear me? There is nothing you've done and nothing you've said that makes you beyond God's reach. All you need to do is walk toward him. And again, I don't care if you've never heard this before or you've you know, prayed a million times. It doesn't matter. <laughs> It doesn't matter. If there is a part of you right now that knows that you aren't in the relationship with him that you want to be in, his arms are open. He couldn't delight in you more. There is no greater satisfaction that he could have with you based on anything you do or don't do. You want to know why? Because when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. When he looks at you, the blood of Jesus covers everything that you do. So he doesn't look at you and say, you know, I saw what you did there that nobody knows about, and you keep hiding it. You're addicted to that thing, you know that? You're addicted to it. It's not him. That voice is not him, because when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. So I want to encourage you. Um, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to dismiss us. And while we're praying, I really want to just encourage you to seek those pieces of, of yourself and see where you're at. And all you need to do is walk toward him. That's it. He did this whole thing, this whole ball game, for you and for me. Let's pray. Lord, uh, Ishmael is just such an interesting character in your story. And there are questions that we might not ever get answered, but it's just amazing to see the mercy that you show him. Even as the, the, the son that was not the promised son, the one through which you would build this family of yours, you're merciful to him. How much more so to us if we know Jesus? How much more so to us if we know Jesus? And so, Father, I pray for all of the hearts that are in this room that are in all different places on their spiritual journey. Some might feel like they've just started. Some might feel like they've been in the game for a long time. Some might be wondering whether or not they want to get in the game at all. And Lord, I pray that through the ministry of your Holy Spirit that you would impress upon every single person here that your arms are wide open for those that walk toward you. 
and in every area of our lives, even the areas that we're holding back from you, the areas that you think we, you must just be so disappointed in us, in the darkest areas of our heart and our lives, you say, come, bring that to me. And so, Lord, give us the courage to bring it to you. Give us the courage to walk out of this room changed, not seeking some kind of salvation experience or whatever that we may thought, have thought we had already or, or whatever, Lord, but we just want to be changed by you. We want to walk out the door different. We are grateful for the work of Jesus that makes all this possible. And I'm grateful to be with these folks and just be able to open your word and talk about you. There's nothing better. There's no other way I'd rather spend my time. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.